We're going to have some q and A. I I don't know if I have any more helpers around. Do I have any more helpers? Anybody left? Um, we're just, I guess we're just going to have people yell out their questions. <laughs> um, I'd like to start a question, though, with Liz. Um, your film is really fascinating, and it seems like it was filmed over a kind of a wide period of time. I can tell by my hair, hair length. <laughs> Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you started it and then where it went and how it ended up um, being what it is? Yes. Um, it was, you know, for me, in, in some ways, uh, a bit of a home movie. I was working with a friend of mine, Karen Merchant, and uh, we were both in film school, and I'm not one of those kinds of filmmakers that can, you know, write some fabricated story and do all the production. I'm someone who really loves to kind of uh, capture what I observe. And um, at the time, I was spending most of my time just chasing the bands that I particularly enjoyed. And also, you know, it was, you know, the energy and, and it was just the time and it was where I wanted to be. So I was, whatever we had, whether it was our still cameras, our Super 8 cameras, occasionally we could get a 16 millimeter camera and the Nagra out when there was no equipment that was working. We would find a reel-to-reel -reel in those days, <laughs> in the 1970s, with the big old TV camera. And basically, this is a, a film that I, we never finished, as you can tell. All that slug at the end, my apologies. Um, and it was, in some ways, that slice of life, what we were doing, kind of what we were listening to at home, the vinyl we were spinning. So you get all that kind of intermixing in. It makes it extremely messy. So um, I hid this film for as long as I could, you know, in some box in the back of a closet. And um, it, it got seen by a couple of people who liked it the way it was and the kind of energy we didn't, in some ways, I guess, have time to edit that raw kind of feeling we had about where we were at out. And so, um, because we, you know, we just let it go. So um, that's what it is. And recently, uh, I'm the, one of the film curators at the Exploratorium, and we had an amazing archivist up from UCLA, uh, Dino Everett, and he managed, yeah, he's a phenomenal guy, uh, incredibly knowledgeable. And during lunch, he mentioned playing music and, like, you know, punk. And it was like, oh, well, I did this whole thing, you know, in the 70s. And so he asked to see it, and I ran away. But my, someone who works with me <laughs> pulled out the DVD and showed it to him. And I was surprised. He just thought it was quite remarkable. So he's actually taken as much of the original as... I can find, and he's in the process of restoring it, and he received a grant from the National Film Preservation Foundation to, you know, H, uh, transfer it to digital and create a HD. And so in the meantime, I'm looking for whatever other artifacts, so thank you for mentioning the uh, history department, mm -hmm. because there's plenty that I've got in that oh, yeah. closet. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, Great. So whatever else in the process now, you know, kind of repaying attention to it. But um, so apologies for how messy it is. But <laughs> <laughs> Glorious mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But see, it makes a great companion in many ways, because Mindy's film, you know, you can identify the bands, we're all over the map, but there's a lot of the, it's the same time. And I also want to thank Mindy because encountering him at the MAB, he was phenomenally generous. You know, when we're, we show up finally with our 16 and, and, you know, the Nagra sound recorder, and he would help, you know, hey, you guys, we're going to set up some lights here, but you can stand here instead of going, this is my territory tonight. Get out of here, kid. So, um, you know, just a phenomenal people to work with. Well, Mindy, I think that your film is probably one of the most important films to come out of the um, early punk scene, and I'm yeah. super happy that we were able to show it tonight. Um, do you know if 
PFA is planning on restoring it, and will they also show it? Or? Well, they've already uh, restored it. They were very generous, and they made a um, new um, um, uh, internegative copy, and they made two prints that ah. are available for rental from the Pacific Film Archive. So when I made the film, I never even thought of those kinds of things, and um, it keeps on living. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right on. <laughs> Wonderful. That was great sound. It's so exciting to see all those folks. I'm going to open this up to questions. Do, did anybody think of anything clever or not clever or <laughs> curious? The gentleman in the front row? There were some interesting sweaters during that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, that's a statement. We had interesting sweaters. We were always shopped at the thrift stores. Yep. That was uh, de rigueur. So, um, Sweaters was a lot of what you got. We have a question from Marion. It's this is kind of technical, but I was wondering, Liz, you had a spot. I think it was the Dills where you just did stop motion. I mean, I wondered why, or was there something technical? You were I, I, I think some of that is just the way we were editing it. You know, we would shoot. I would blow up instead of eating whatever. You take whatever little money you have. And we would blow up all the, we blowed up all the Super 8 to 16. And then, you know, out of all that, we, I, I wanted that mix of materials. I wanted there to be that materiality. And so cutting it up with other things, and sometimes it would be maybe, you know, I had a little trigger on my Super 8, so you could, you know, do a little bit of that, you know, with the camera, but some of it we also, uh, you know, some of it was optically printed. That's we we did some of that. You know, I I was in film school, so you know you were, besides testing a bunch of stuff, it was whatever you could get your hands on. And then I just loved the 16 millimeter. You could work with it so much better. So getting all of it blown up for us meant that we could work with it. And it was in some ways, you know, it was. As I said, it was, a, for me, a phenomenal time in terms of the kinds of issues that were being addressed, but also that physicality, the mosh pit, all of it, and I wanted that captured as much in the material as it was, uh, you know, kind of captured on film. I just want to say thank you for the Will Shatter footage. <laughs> well, you can, it's, yeah. He was an amazing person. I see a question in the back there. Uh, thank you. I didn't know about the Deaf Club, and it seemed um, that scene was kind of interesting, so. I didn't know if half the people were deaf and then they could feel the music through their feet and their body or what was happening there. It was interesting. Oops. I can give you a lot of uh, info on the Deaf Club. There was a manager of the group, The Offs, that you saw in the film named uh, Bob Hanrahan, and he got kind of out with uh, Dirk Dirksen at the Mabuhai, so he was looking for an alternative venue, and he was cruising down Valencia near 16th, where the Deaf Club is located, and the Deaf Club is a part of a whole consortium of deaf people in the United States, and they're a very democratic or organization. They don't care if you're black or white or what, young or old, deafness brings them together. And so he went upstairs when he saw the sign, Hall for Rent, and he saw a television set on, no sound. He didn't make much notice of that, and there were two guys sitting in front of it. And then when he tried to talk to them, he realized that he was talking to two deaf people, and he explained to them that he would like to rent the hall uh, for his band. And the most, two of the most interesting things that occurred was that um, deaf people don't make any noise. And it's located near a lot of apartment buildings in the uh, uh, Valencia Quarter. And it was like a jet engine took off one night and 
suddenly there was noise and it used to be visited by the police almost every night. It had a short existence, I think about six months. And two things which were phenomenal was that uh, the young uh, people, because it was all ages, deafness brought them together, was that they could not hear the music, but they felt it viscerally, you know, like the thump of the bass and the drums. And there was a um, almost an ecstatic look in their face because they finally realized that they could dance. And it was, you know, just delightful to see that. Um, and the other thing was <laughs> the police coming there every night. And I remember... Um, coming down the steps once and this uh, lady cop and a male cop were coming up the stairs and the lady cop was a black American woman and I had my black leather jacket on. She looked at me and she says, black is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really cool, but it didn't last very long simply because of the noise level that occurred in the neighborhood. So that's the uh, short history of the Deaf Club. <laughs> and there was a little artifact in the film. You saw this notebook. I don't know how many I noted it because sitting at the bar, a lot of the ways that those of us that don't know how to sign would communicate was we would just write back notes back and forth. And so there was there, there was an intermixing of, you know, the communities. It was yeah. a really, it was a prime spot for as long as it lasted. Um, I just want to add that it was a rather shoddy structure and that the floor would move. And that one of, the, one of the reasons why the deaf people could dance was because they could feel the music through the floor, which was going like this, pretty much. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions out there? Yes, the gentleman in the yeah, back. Did you ever get harassed? Because I know if we saw the media at our shows, we didn't like the cameras there. We didn't want to be popular. We wanted to keep it our team. Did that ever happen to you? Not that I recall. No. Okay. Not that I recall. But, you know, it's like that's 40 years ago. Maybe I've diminished those <laughs> memories. <laughs> I think that we probably wouldn't have considered you guys the media. Right. We would have considered you our friends who somehow got their hands on some film cameras. <laughs> I couldn't play guitar, but I certainly wanted to do something besides jump up and down, which was wonderful. But, you know, it was participatory. I mean, in some ways, if we think about how a community is made and all the elements, making music and making, you know, cinema and writing and producing and posters and all of it, it was, it was the, uh, the, sa the impulse was the same for us, I think. Yeah. No, it was a very um, communal or community existence in that um, you would see people in the audience and they would look up and they say, man, you only need to know one chord or maybe two or three and you can make music. I can do that. So the next week they would be on the stage and it had a delightful, you know, uh, continuing resurgence. And uh, because uh, I'm 83 years old, I've been around the block a couple of times and I've been a, uh, a beadnik and a uh, uh, full-time hippie and a punk. And I think all those three elements are still in me. <laughs> and uh, I always look for community. And in the United States, the way things are going, we are being alienated from each other, irrespective of race or, you know, creed or anything. And I think that uh, my reason for joining that scene was that it was when people themselves were feeling certain things and they needed to express these things. And that's a very human attribute. And I think we can't deny it. I mean, otherwise we wind up in a concentration camp and uh, uh, Nazi Germany is an excellent example of that. They would never last because the uh, spirit to be free is totally ingrained in our DNA. I believe that, you know, so I think, uh, these kinds of expressions are very uh, useful in promoting our humanity, if you will. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would also like to add that um, I think the media was fairly unified in ignoring the punk scene in the early days. Uh, 
the people that wrote about it in the papers were really scoffing at us. And then t for television or any other level of media, it was really very little. Um, very few radio stations were playing, maybe two radio stations. So, uh, yeah, we didn't really have that much interaction with the media at all. And that's another reason why I would love to have anybody donate whatever they can to the archive so that we can sort of keep the real uh, record of what happened uh, alive. Um, I think we have one more question here. Hey, uh, it, it, growing up in Southern California, I didn't get into it until the late 80s, but we still got harassed a bunch. Like, we, it was dangerous, you know, to be into it, but I'm a kid, I'm only 40 right now, right? So, like, uh, <laughs> but I got into it real young, but in all the books, and, you know, I obsess about sociology so much and all the youth tribes, and, and uh, I really dig on all, of, like, the scene uh, documentation, but one thing I don't hear that much in the SF scene documentation is how dangerous it was or wasn't to be punk at that time. Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Because all the SoCal ones, you hear about how dangerous it was just to be walking around the street, which it is dangerous to walk around the street in SoCal to this day because no one does, right? Everyone drives, but we don't hear about it up here as much. Was it more permissive or do, you, do people just not talk about it that much? I would say um, that the scene in 77, 78, 79 really was was pretty small and um, I think a lot of people, I had blue hair sometime in I guess 78 and a lot of people just had never seen that. They just, their mouths would just drop open. Kids on the bus would be like, oh, your hairdresser hates you, you know? It's like, they did not recognize what we were if you were walking around. For, for the older, you know, brothers and sisters of mine in the scene, uh, they've turned me on to just how, like, sketchy that was to be that person where we grew up, you know, back then. And then I moved to SF because of that reason, like, in the mid-90s. But, I, you know, I was, like, younger. But since we don't hear about it that much as being up here and my older buddies, which I have shitloads, like, I have a lot, like, all my, I'm on Jack's team, a lot of my bros obviously were in the scene with you guys, you know, Nosmo and Paul Castile and... John Marsh and everybody, you know, like Kevin O'Connor, you guys know those dudes growing up, but uh, they don't talk about how sketchy it was back then. Maybe it wasn't that bad up here. I, you know. <laughs> well, uh, I personally, uh, I personally feel we live in much more dangerous times now. Yeah. I'm uh, noticing a lack of manners. When you walk down a street and a person's coming towards you, he totally does not seem to be aware of your presence and you are the one that has to step out of their way and when I was growing up as a child in Los Angeles you stepped a little bit to your right and the other person stepped a little bit to the to the left and now also because of the electronic media uh, people are totally not paying attention to reality they're paying attention to virtual reality and I think that's a very fascistic direction and I think that the powers that be love to see that because power needs control and anyone that is out of control however that manifests itself Itself is a danger to the powers that be and I think they're producing a bunch of sheep uh, and I find that very much more dangerous now than you know don't forget because of my age I grew up after the Second World War when the GIs came back and Nirvana was on the headlines you know and you were able to as a working person buy a home send your kids to school you can't do that anymore and I think that the power Powers that be like that because they're consolidating their hold over you and the more electronic media comes into play the less you will understand reality that's just my personal view but I I've seen that every day I live in North Beach so I see both the tourists and I see you know the people that live in North Beach and it's a it's chaos let me tell you <laughs> it is chaos <laughs> Oh, we've got one from Kathy Peck up here. Yay, Kathy! You Question. Know, um, I have to say, you really captured 
the old Mav and all the bands and the Deaf Club. And also, you know, also there's a lot of folks there that aren't here anymore, like Britley Black and Dave Bacon and Ricky Sleeper and, you know, all these guys. And it was just like, and Don Vinyl, man, that was incredible. So it, it's, it's awesome. And you captured every, how you felt and how the bathroom felt and how the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the bathroom. And how people yeah. were like just, you know, on stage, just like into it and the, 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 the feeling of it. It was awesome. You're great too, Penelope. <laughs> You're awesome. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you. It was well, lovely. thank yeah. you. And thank you everybody for coming. I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, and just to get off your cell phone and look other people in the eye every now and then. I think that's a good idea. I hope you all can come to the other um, film nights we are having. And thank you for coming. I was thrilled seeing those films myself. It was great. And I'd just like to shout out to, uh, speaking of our fallen brothers, I'd just like to say, you know, a moment for Ralph Carney and for Zev. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Super uh, creative musicians in this in this SF scene. Thank you again for coming. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you guys.